My name is John Lobel. I teach architecture at Pratt Institute. I blog at johnlobel.com, review movies from a mythological point of view at cinemadiscourse.com, and you can reach me at johnlobel at macmac.com. This is a recording of a lecture that I gave for first year architectural history at Pratt Institute, Arch 151, in September of 2013. What is the relationship between architecture and society? We want to continue our discussion of the relationship between architecture and society. And when we say society, we're looking in rather broad terms. Here are four houses. We're going to look at all of these in considerable detail over the next two years. This is Villa Rotunda by Andrea Palladio, very important architect. This is Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water. This is Frank Gehry's own house. And this is Katsura Imperial Villa in Japan. Why are they so different? Of course, structure, function, but also the cultures that they are a part of. And we will look in a little bit of detail at um, a couple of them. So, how do we approach architecture? Function, structure and material, space, as one part of a culture, architecture, painting, sculpture, literature, but also in terms of social issues and in very rough terms. We'll look at some examples of means of production, gender roles, religion, and worldview. Worldview will be the one that we'll concentrate on a bit. Now, means of production. It's a very big term. It's fundamental to any analysis of human society. And the biggies, the big means of production, there are uh, four of them over history, hunting, gathering, agriculture, industry, and today, perhaps something new, we're in an information society. And to just look at one sliver, one small example, the Industrial Revolution moved us from the small <coughs> farm to the suburbs. In a small farm, the home is a place of both production and consumption. You grow food, you prepare food, you eat the food. You go out to the workshop, you make a chair, and then you sit on the chair. With industrialization, this is split. You make the chair in a factory, you sit on it in the home. So you, the house now becomes purely a place of consumption, no production. In the 1940s and 50s, when suburbs were really getting rolling, you know, you were really embarrassed if you had a neighbor who had chickens. So, oh, yeah, those hillbillies down the street. You weren't supposed to do any producing. You went off to the factory or the office to do producing. And so with that division, we got the emergence of the suburban home. So here is a small farm. And here is one of Frank Lloyd Wright's early houses, the Ward Willett House, 1901, and we'll be looking at that. And it's an early suburban home. There's no farming here. <laughs> There's no chickens in the backyard. And this looks very much like uh, an upscale suburban home to this day. There are a lot of things to talk about in Frank Lloyd Wright and the emergence of this early modern architecture, but one of them is this home became a place purely of consumption. As a result of the Industrial Revolution, you went off to work in the office or the factory. Now, once we understand that, something interesting happens. Here we are today. If you've got a laptop and a all-purpose printer, scanner, fax, Xerox, printer, and a laptop, you, you've, you're a whole production operation in your home. Now, production can take place again in the home. What's this going to mean for architecture? You people can think about that. Gender roles. Again, we've got all of human history that we'll be covering in this course, but let's just look a little bit recently with the Industrial Revolution, men went to work in the office or factory and made money. 
in the 60s, feminists would say that men were very clever. They give them to each other pieces of green paper for the work they do. Women didn't figure that out. So they're doing just as much work as men, but they didn't figure out that they should give each other green paper for it. So they were out of the money economy. So now what do women do? If men are working in the factory or the office, should housework be farmed out so that both men and women uh, work out of the side of the house? Should we apply industrial efficiency to the home, home economics? Home economics is a term that comes up in the late 1900s, seeing the economical efficiency of the machine age being applied in the factory, why don't we apply that in the home as well? Then the women have the same multiplier tools that the men have. Should we have labor-saving devices that make housework easier and both men and women can work outside the home? What? So imagine it's 1860 and this industrial station is just beginning to happen the husband and wife had been a, not only a family unit, but had been an economic partnership working equally on that small farm. Now that's shattered. What new arrangement will emerge? Here is Marie Stevens Howland proposing that in the community of the future, suppose we had the houses had no kitchens and you would have four houses clustered around a communal kitchen where there was paid professional help making the food. Then men and women would be equal and could both go to work. So that was one proposal. Didn't happen, but it was one. Here's another one. Catherine Beecher, Harry Beecher Stowe's sister, proposed the American Women's Home 1869. And she said, we should apply this industrial efficiency to the home that has been applied to the factory. And so she imagined a central core which would have the furnace, kitchen, bathrooms, Franklin stoves, and Franklin stoves, no fireplaces because they suck out all the warm air, bring in a draft. And she's got, you see dotted lines here. She's bringing in the um, replacement air above through, through ventilating ducts so that you don't have drafts and then an open, flexible space around that core. Her aesthetic was rather a gingerbread house, but that's exactly what Frank Lloyd Wright did with the massive chimney core in the center uh, of his prairie-style houses, and, but gave it a modern aesthetic. So here is the debate over gender roles as a result of this industrialization having an impact on architecture. And again, today, you stop at salad bar on the way home. <laughs> you know, the average refrigerator today has a quart of orange juice and some prescription medicine. <laughs> and then in the freezer is the vodka. <laughs> the beer, right, here's the beer can right here. Beer can and leftover Chinese food. So, What's this going to mean? I mean, people today can't even make coffee. What's the, what is the implication of this for architecture? People can think about that. Religion. So the question of religion becomes, what is the relationship between God, the church, and the congregation? Let's look at three examples. So in Catholicism, this exact same slide, John had before. In Catholicism, you get access to God and to the religious realm, if you're Catholic, through the institution of the church. It does not come directly. So under the dome is the priest, and then you are in the nave. So the dome is for the priest, the word of God comes through here and then out to the congregation. Now, interestingly, uh, this is St. Peter's again, uh, Michelangelo's and Bramante's versions were centrally planned. It was symmetrical all the way around. And the ch architects liked that better. But the church said, no, we're not going to accept that. And this got added on. 
in part to handle the larger crowds, but in part for this theological reason. So there's a, a pattern, the one that uh, John showed us, coming from this notion of how relationship to transcendence works. In Islam, there is no hierarchy. Everybody has direct relationship to God. In the mosque, everybody's under God equal. There are respected teachers, but there's no pope. There's no religious hierarchy. But there might be informally or politically, but those people don't have any mystical um, stature that you don't have. And so here in the Mosque of Cordoba, we see a very uniform grid uh, in, in, in implying this equality. Now here, look at Frank Lloyd Wright again, is Frank Lloyd Wright's Unity Temple. It's a Unitarian congregation. <coughs> now, again, we're going to look at this building uh, next year. This is the school entrances here, and here's the main church. And the main church works with um, a double balcony here and here, going all the way around, and the minister, not priest, but minister is here. And so we're kind of sitting in this horseshoe so that we can look at each other as part of a community. So the community becomes important here. So three different religious attitudes, three different architectural arrangements. And finally, worldview. So, what is a worldview? There is only one philosophical question. So, if you take a philosophy course, they're going to give you a lot of BS about all kinds of theory and stuff like that. But it's all to um, disguise the fact that the question is very simple. Who are we and what are we doing here? So, well, obviously, we are biological creatures who have achieved consciousness due to the evolution of a cerebral cortex, living in a material world governed by the laws of physics. How many people believe that? Nobody. Wow. <laughs> no materialists. Well, we got one, we got two, two materialists, three, four, five, five materialists. Okay, so if you think about it, as you go through school, as you encounter uh, different uh, sociological theory, different discussions of human beings, very often this is in the background. This is the underlying assumptions. This is an example of a worldview. But, or, <clears throat> here's some other possibilities. Uh, th this first one is the one I just showed you. The world is material and scientific laws. Humans came about through evolutionarily random accidents, and consciousness is the firing of neurons. Now, I'm going to label these. Uh, the, this is a materialist position. The world and we were created by a creator. Our purpose is to obey the creator. This is uh, today in the biblical traditions, begins in Mesopotamia, and so we find it in the ancient Mesopotamian beliefs, but today Christianity, Judaism, and Islam um, uh, fundamentalist versions of these because a lot of Protestant Christianity would not hold that but Christianity, Judaism, Islam hold this position. Now here's another one. The wor there is no creator. The world has always been. I mean what would it have come from if it hadn't always been and will never end. Consciousness is a fundamental part of the world. Our consciousness is a partaking of a universal consciousness. <coughs> Human nature and spirit are one unified whole. What tradition might that be? Anybody want to give that a name? It's Eastern thought in general, and Buddhism holds this position. Now, we can imagine these as subversions of these, or additional ones, or 
Maybe you could believe uh, a black one and a red one. Uh, the fundamental existential, exist meaning existence, the fundamental thing that exists is God. We should continually relearn God's will. The fundamental existential entity is the planet and its ecosystem. We are guests and should leave things as undisturbed as possible. If you believe that, what label would, might we give you? You're an ecologist. Uh, the fundamental existential entity is the individual human being. The prime purpose of the individual is self-realization, identifying meaning, identifying one's potential and fulfilling it. Anybody know the label for that one? Humanist. This comes from the humanist tradition. The fundamental existential entity is the society. One should subsume oneself to the common good. Does anybody have a label for that one? Socialism, socialism, communism, and more recently, communitarianism. So I actually um, number these, and we uh, have a little homework assignment in my graduate seminar where everybody goes home, picks one, and writes a little, you know, one page on why, and then we find there's a lot of mixture. Well, I'm three quarters, you know, one, and one quarter, seven. <laughs> So, you know, we don't have to, but here's the point. Well, first of all, just stretch this out a little bit. Anybody think we've got it covered? This is John Archibald Wheeler, one of the great physicists worked with Einstein. No phenomena is a real phenomena until it is an observed phenomena. This is fundamental to quantum physics is the dominant form of physics today. If you don't look at a particle, it doesn't exist. And how you look at it affects how it exists. Now that has some interesting philosophical implications. It means that we <coughs> are not an accident that just sort of arrived here. We're fundamental, our consciousness is fundamental to what the universe is. And Hawking has said, how, you re how did the universe begin? What happened at the Big Bang? Well, that was a quantum event. How we observe it changes it. That's what these people believe. These are the leading physicists in the world today. Um, there are people who believe that the universe is a giant computer, a giant, this is all a giant quantum computation. We'll look at that again uh, later. And one of the figures who believes this is Stephen Wolfram, brilliant uh, person. I just, I just get off watching his lectures on YouTube. And he's worked out something called Celia Automata. Very simple rules can make very complex things. He believes some very simple rules make our universe. He says, I think when I find the code that generates our universe, it'll be just six lines. All of this comes from six lines of codes. There are a lot of people who believe that. So these are different worldviews. Now, I'm going to give you a definition of architecture. Architecture is the crystallization of a culture's worldview into form. So you have these worldviews. And in order to understand their worldview, a culture makes cultural artifacts, paintings, novels, sculpture, architecture. And why do they make this, why do they invest what they invested to make a Gothic cathedral? I mean, that is huge in terms of the economy of the time for a little town like Chartres to make a Gothic cathedral. I mean, it's a stretch for us to do it today. It took them 20 years to build the National Cathedral in Washington, which is a genuine Gothic cathedral. It's, it's not Catholic, but it's, it's they didn't use steel. They, used, they made it real Gothic construction. It was a real effort to do it today with our monster economy. So why did they do that? They did it to have a physical manifestation of their worldview. The great modern architect of glass and steel, Mies van der Rohe, says, 
<coughs> architecture is the will of an epic translated into space. And Frank Lloyd Wright says, every architect is necessarily a great poet. He must be a great original interpreter of his time, his day, his age, meaning his culture and its worldview. So let's look at two worldviews. Let's look at two cultures and just see this as an example of uh, what I've been describing. So um, now, first of all, I should say this is very oversimplified. And, but it's a way to kind of get a, a, grisp, a, gr a grasp on this. So let's look at the East, China and Japan. What is the Eastern worldview and how is it translated into architecture? I'm going to suggest that, <clears throat> again, in very simplistic terms, there are three things, God, man, and nature. And we want to try to avoid using the term man, so God, human, and nature. In the East, there's a notion that human beings are natural animals and spirit is in all things. So there isn't three things. There's only one unified whole. The notion of there's a God out there who created the world, it's just not, it's just, what is that, you know, from a traditional Chinese or Japanese point of view? And so let's see what then happens in their architecture. I'm going to suggest that a culture begins by laying down its epic poem and its temple form. And we'll talk about that over the, you know, course of the course. But let's look at a key literary work of the East. <clears throat> and I'm going to jump back and forth between China and Japan. So in China, we have something called the Tao Te Ching. And it's by Lao Tzu, L-A-O-T-Z-U. And I, there are many spellings of that in terms of how the translation is done. And it begins, the Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. So the Tao is the way of all things, <clears throat> which you cannot know because it transcends concept. So I just said what it is, but you're not supposed to. You're not supposed to be able to. And then later we find, do you think you can take over the universe and improve it? I do not think it can be done. The universe is sacred. You cannot improve it. Now here is, we'll take this as an example of a Chinese temple, and the nature flows through it. It's open. And so there's this harmonious flow of all things. And the Tao Te Ching presents the principles whereby we should be living our lives, and we should be living them, taking lessons from nature in terms of having a harmonious life. Now, we'll take this as a typical Eastern painting. It's a landscape, Chinese landscape. And we've got mm -hmm. three things here. We have nature, we have human beings, and we have architecture. We got to look twice to find the human beings. <laughs> here, and here's the architecture. The point is, they do not metaphysically pop. Now. I'm cheating here by picking you know, these examples because I could find a Chinese or Japanese portrait in which the figure would be in the foreground, for example, the way it is here in Western art. So I'm exaggerating. But here we have in the West, very famous painting by Leonardo da Vinci, the Mona Lisa. Here's the figure. There's the background. I think you don't miss the figure. <laughs> you can't miss it. Nature's there, but look at how subordinated it is to the human being. So this is a humanist position. We'll look at this again in a minute. This is a Shinto. Now we're switching over to Japan. <clears throat> this is a Shinto shrine. Compare this to a Gothic cathedral. So what do we have here? An identification of a particularly spiritually powerful spot in nature. This tree seems to be kind of special. It seems to have a, a, a spiritual power to it. I feel good vibrations coming from it. And so you mark it with this rope and then put a little fence around it so people won't litter it. And there's your temple. And then later maybe we'll add a little shrine where you can put offerings. And so here is 
a sense of the integration of the human, the spiritual, and nature. So we're going to look at one example, again in Japan, Katsura Imperial Villa. So this was built for a sort of retired nobleman who did not, uh, was not in politics. And so now what is he going to do? Donald Cromley will describe this in some detail next year, but, or next semester, but what's the most obvious thing we see here? Strongly integrated with nature. So it's very much in and a part of nature. Now there's a little trick here, and that is, and we'll, we'll talk about this a lot, nature is a very tricky word. What is natural and what is not natural? And there's no strict definition. And when we say nature, look at the natural, I mean, they found this beautiful landscape and then put this, nope. All this is human made to look natural by their standards of the time. That's also true of Central Park in Manhattan. And we'll talk about that when we, you know, we get to the uh, 19th century. And the building is asymmetrical. It's rambling. There's not a strong division between inside and outside. It rambles. It's asymmetrical. It's sort of open to the outside. And we'll talk about this slide um, next year, but the, uh, an extremely strong sensitivity to the materials, understanding the wood, exactly how it works, understanding the stone, et cetera, et cetera. And the notion that there's a spirit in that wood, and you want to let that spirit express itself. And a notion of space that it's layered. Japanese space is sort of understood to be like an onion of layers. It, it's not volumetric like ours, very different. And so these uh, sliding screens uh, allow us to experience that. OK, that was the East. Uh, now we'll do the West. So what is the Western worldview? And how is it translated into architecture? And there's a lot you know, going on in the West. I'm going to define the West as from about 1,000 AD to today. And other commentators would include Greece, Greece and Rome. But I'm separating that out for this purpose. Although Greece and Rome share uh, these ideas. And also, there's, there's, you know, early on, we have a, a more religious worldview, starting with the Renaissance. We have humanism. So I'm going to sort of jump to the Renaissance and look at humanism. So of God, human, and nature, uh, human or man is the highest and is central. So God is a function of the human imagination. And nature is knowable and controllable through human facilities. What's a technical term we have for that? Our ability to know and control nature. Science and technology. I mean, right down to we can take a single photon and play with it. You know, we can stop its spin. We can, you know, I mean, the degree to which we can know and control nature um, is amazing. Now, here is a very famous painting. It's part of the Sistine Chapel ceiling by Michelangelo. And it's the 1500s. This would seem to put the lie to what I just said. So here is Adam. God created Adam out of clay. Adam was dead. There was no spirit. And God then breathed spirit into Adam. So spirit comes from the outside. It's not in all in. It's not in all things. It comes from the outside. And this is the magic electrical touch that's going to spark at him. But has anybody encountered the recent discussion of this? People have been looking at this for 500 years. And about 10 years ago, somebody noticed something. That's the profile of a section of the human brain. God is within the human imagination. Now, Michelangelo would never say that. He'd get executed for that. But he slipped it in there. And we know these guys knew their anatomy, uh, totally, because they did cadaver anatomy. They cut up dead bodies. That's how they know how all these, get all these muscles right. 
In the Arthurian Romances, which is our epic poem for the West, epic poems, these are the stories of King Arthur, Knights of the Round Table, 11 and 1200, and they sort of lay down the basic psychology of the West. In fact, if you look at the Percival myth and the, and the Fisher King, it is just about, I don't know, half of all movies ever made is, a, is a direct. I'm going to talk about that at noon, so at 12.30. So uh, just from one of these Arthurian romances, Quest for the Holy Grail, the knights are at dinner, and the Holy Grail appears. The Holy Grail is, no one knows what it is. It may be the chalice from which Christ drank wine at his last supper, but it's the thing that you're seeking. So the Holy Grail appears veiled, and one of the knights say, I propose that we take a vow uh, not to finish this dinner until we, we go on a quest and we have viewed the Holy Grail unveiled. And they all agree, and they each entered the forest at a point he himself chose where it was darkest <clears throat> and there was no path or way. In the West, if there is a path, it is someone else's path. It's not yours. In this culture, we're very big on no plagiarism. Uh, I worked with a Tibetan monk who was a great sand painter, the great Tibetan sand painter. And, you know, they make these huge mandalas with colored sand. It would take maybe a week well, to make this. And we were doing a Tibetan cultural center in New York at Pratt. He came out with his buddies in their monk's robes for the jury. And he looks at, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I'm driving him back to New York. And he says, each student does their own project. <laughs> it was a totally foreign notion in his culture. So this is a Western idea. And of course, it's spreading. Now, it's going to be interesting to discuss this because is this Western or is it modern? And is there a difference? Has Japan been Westernizing or modernizing? And how do we define the difference? So this is something we can discuss. Now, this notion has the moral center in each individual. So, in the adventures of Huckleberry Finn, Huck is helping Jim, an escaped slave, escape in their adventures going down the Mississippi River. And he knows what he's doing is a sin because the preacher has, he's learned it in school, the preacher has preached, you've stolen property, particularly a slave. This is a mortal sin. And he says, I shouldn't be doing this. I shouldn't. And then he finally says, I'm going to do it. All right, then I'll go to hell. So we appreciate that his inner moral voice is a more valid um, judge of right and wrong than society's rules. So this is a Western notion. So here, now, the individual comes forward. Nature is in the background. Now, what that individual is is a long story. See, here we see in the Renaissance, um, if we went back and we'll see later in the course, in medieval art, there's not a lot of awareness of anatomy. They just sort of drape a robe over the person. Very big eyes, because the soul is what's important. But here we are just a few years later with Renaissance art, where uh, we have a very knowledgeable anatomy. So we are a body as well as a, a soul and a mind. And there's a signaling that we're tying ourselves back to ancient Greece, because this looks very much like a Greek sculpture. And everybody knew it at the time. So we're, we're borrowing the, the Greek humanism, bringing it into the West. And there's an inner psychology going on in this guy's thinking. His thoughts going on in there. And then here is, that was Michelangelo's David. Here's Raphael's School of Athens. And there's a way in which we can appreciate that, OK, here is um, Plato. Here's Aristotle and they've been updated from Greece into the nave of the under construction St. Peter's that we just heard about. And here are figures from Greece and Rome and the present, the Renaissance present. And really, all together, they constitute all the parts of an individual that poetry, art, science, math, all are part of ourselves. So this is sort of announcing that. And then with the Baroque, 
And here's Rembrandt, the self-portrait. There's an emotional depth. So we continually add these layers to this individual human being as we go through the West. Now, the home for this humanist human. And so we'll pick Andrea Palladio's Villa Rotunda. We'll hear about this uh, from Donald in some detail next year. <clears throat> but uh, Palladio is an extremely important architect. Probably, he's usually labeled the most influential architect of all time. And he's got to be in the top, I don't know, five of <laughs> the most important architects. And so this is a uh, weekend house for a retired clergyman. And it's for go there, read his library, entertaining. And what do we see here? Well, first, it dominates the landscape. It's not sort of integrated in the way that Katsura was. It's on top of the hill, dominating the landscape, and it's bilaterally symmetrical. Now, it's actually not, because uh, notice this side is a little different from this side, but roughly bilaterally sym symmetrical. Now, usually, the dome is, announces, it, it, usually a dome is a dome of heaven, announcing the importance of God. Here, it marks the place where the human being stands. It's not referring to heaven. It's referring to humanism. So we stand here symbolically. And this is very symbolic. You can see how this house wouldn't be that convenient. Uh, downstairs are the kitchens and everything. But, where, you know, where, where do you, how do you use it? And the point is, you stand there and appreciate it more than you, you know, can put your feet up and watch a big screen um, TV. So, in a Cartesian XYZ axis, there's a figure, Protagoras, who we know from Plato, one of the dialogues, and Protagoras says, man is the measure of all things. Now, Plato disagrees, but let's take Protagoras's position. That we know the world from our point of view. Now, Plato says it's possible to know the world from an absolute point of view, and that's a longer discussion, but let's just take this position. So if we say, well, for example, I'm going to measure where everybody is in this room, and you are twice as far away from me as he is, from me. So I have to know where I am to do this. So if I'm going to do science and I'm going to, you know, time the dropping of the apple, I got to be there as an observer with my stopwatch or my pulse. And so where do I stand to do this? Well, I want to stand at the center of Descartes X, Y, and if you go to three dimensions, it's X, Y, Z axis. And that's exactly what Palladio gives us in the Villa Rotunda. It marks the human being as the central thing, as opposed to God or nature. So we can see the contrast between these two. Integrated and flowing into the landscape, on top of the hill, marking the central point where the human being is. Integrated into the landscape, on top of the hill. Now, you could probably find some eastern examples that stand on top of the hill and some western examples integrated with the landscape. So let's just admit that we're oversimplifying here and it gives us a chance to sort of see architecture as a response to its culture. Now, I showed you Frank Lloyd Wright's we talked about the emergence of suburban house in response to industrialization. And I showed you Frank Lloyd Wright's Ward Willett House. It doesn't look like the Villa Rotunda. Well, maybe it does. Notice this sort of cross shape, and Frank Lloyd Wright's got a cross shape. It's got a center. Wright's got a center, but he doesn't. He puts the fire 
place chimney core there, so we are pushed out of there. But it's sort of done consciously, so it's sort of we're aware that we can't be there. And maybe it's a little bit like Katsura in that it's somewhat it's asymmetrical, it meanders, it integrates with the landscape, it interpenetrates inside and outside. Maybe we're seeing a little bit of an Easternization of the West. And we can look at the whole way that Eastern ideas start to filter into the West, starting in the late 1700s and accelerating. A really big one is 1893, World's Fair, where a disciple of Sri Ramakrishna, a great Hindu saint, comes, and Frank Lloyd Wright sees at the World's Fair a Japanese temple. So these things can sort of migrate. Now, let's wind up here, the East. What do these people think? What do they believe? And then how can that belief be expressed in their worldview? And Lao Tzu says in the Tao Te Ching, do you think you can take over the universe and improve it? I do not believe it can be done. The universe is sacred. You cannot improve it. If you try to change it, you will ruin it. If you try to hold it, you will lose it. So there's an Eastern idea. Let's look at a few characters in the West. We want to see what word might come to mind here. This is a book called The Singularity is Near by Ray Kurzweil. He's probably the leading sort of scientific futurist. And he's an advocate of an idea that we are experiencing exponential growth of technological development which is leading us toward a merging of human and machine intelligence. And it's just going to, it's been going on for 100 years and it's going to keep going, it's going to keep accelerating. And he writes, the explosive nature of exponential growth, in other words, the computer chip doubles in capability every two years and it ain't going to stop. <coughs> so we think, well, you know, this computer is, it? yeah, but this is a thousand times more powerful than my first Macintosh. It said, wow, okay, we're here. No, what do you think is going to happen in another 10 years? It ain't stopping. Means it may only take a quarter of a millennium, 250 years, to go from sending messages on horseback to saturating the matter and energy of our solar system with sublimely intelligent processes. We've got to put these chips in everything. Not, you know, I mean, we're going to merge with machines. The walls will be intelligent. Our spaceships will be intelligent. We're going to terraform Mars. We're going to colonize Mars. But that, that's just the beginning. The ongoing expansion of our, super, our future superintelligence will then require moving out to the rest of the universe. Mm -hmm. You know, there's only so much hydrogen in the water. And you eventually can use all that up in fusion. And then where do you get your energy from? Well, 99.99% .99 of the sun's energy is lost because we're a little dot. And the energy goes in all directions. So you go take Jupiter, you dismantle it, you make a big sphere around the sun, and you can capture all its energy. And when that's not enough, you can goose it up with high energy gamma rays into a controlled supernova. That's the way these guys are thinking. So I told you a couple of weeks ago, I work on a project called Time Ship. Our clients intend to be immortal. They've spent over $100 million finding the genetic cause of aging and turning it off, and we're building a huge research facility for that. I just went this summer to a 2045 <coughs> conference at Lincoln Center. There's a bunch of Russian oligarchs which are funding the building of avatars they can download themselves into. And over here is Seth Lloyd, who says, you know, there are problems with the universe. I, he's a quantum computer uh, professor at MIT, and he's working on reprogramming the universe. That six lines of code, he's going to redo it. So what word comes to mind? Hubris. <laughs> so are these two cultures different or what? <laughs> you know, implying a very different architecture. Now it's up to you to decide what do you believe and how are you going to manifest that in your architecture. Thank you.